transcripts. Needs, is this real world or exercise? FAA, no, this is not an exercise, not a test. On page 20, we note more confusion. Needs did not know where to send the alert fighter aircraft and the officer directing the fighters pressed for more information. Quote, I don't know where I'm scrambling these guys to. I need a direction, a destination, close quote. And on page 26, <clears throat> NORAD heard nothing about the search for American 77. Instead, the Needs Air Defender Defenders heard renewed reports about a plane that no longer existed, American 11. At 9.21, Needs received a report from the FAA. FAA, Military Boston Center. I just had a report that American 11 is still in the air and on its way towards, heading toward Washington. Needs, okay, American 11 is still in the air? FAA, yes, Needs, on its way toward Washington? FAA, that was another, it was evidently another aircraft that hit the tower. That's the latest report we have, Needs, okay. FAA, I'm going to try to confirm an ID for you, but I would assume he's somewhere over uh, New Jersey or somewhere further south. Needs, okay, so American 11 isn't the hijack at all then? FAA, no, he's a hijack. Needs, he, American 11 is a hijack? FAA, yes. Needs, and he's heading into Washington? FAA, yes, this could be a third aircraft. The mention of a third aircraft was not a reference to American 77. As the commission report says, there was confusion at, the mo at that moment in the FAA. And General Eberhardt's claim that the military exercises somehow made the military better prepared on 9-11 does not ring true. Instead, it appears that the concurrent military exercises completely confused everyone. Flight 11 was the flight that hit the first building at the World Trade Center in New York City. Thus far, we are still waiting for the monograph on the failures of NORAD that the Commission said it would produce. 10. Toothless investigation, the story of subpoena power not used. While the Department of Defense and others were threatened with subpoenas for not being forthcoming with information requested, we were of the mindset that all known evidence pertaining to September 11th should have been subpoenaed by the Commission from the outset with no exceptions. No stone, which, by the way, was also the mandate of the 9-11 Commission. No stone should have remained unturned, and yet this was not the case. For example, with regard to videos that recorded the Pentagon crash, we knew of at least three versions of videos that showed the crash of Flight, 90, of Flight 77, yet only one version ever made its way into the public domain. That version had the date stamp of 9-12 instead of 9-11-01. The time stamps repeated on two of the five frames while the other frames, the other times on the frames were missing. We had met, read in National Geographic about the second video that was recorded by cameras located at the Sheraton Hotel overlooking the Pentagon. We also read about the third video recording that showed the crash from the nearby Nexcom gas station security camera. We asked the Commission, specifically Team 8, to subpoena for these videos, and just before the Commission released its final report, we met with some of them. They told us that they had not subpoenaed for this evidence, but had instead issued document requests, which were never answered. This seeming lack of persistence on the part of the Commission to collect all known evidence is worrisome. Again, if in fact they were unwilling to go after easily attainable evidence, what other critical and more difficult pieces of the story were they missing? How was one to feel comfortable with their investigation knowing that they were not aggressively pursuing the most tangible of evidence or information? Also missing from the Commission's definitive report is testimony from national security whistleblowers who had tried to testify before the Commission but were either asked were either not asked to testify or their testimony was only barely acknowledged or worse yet, completely omitted from the record. This list includes Robert Wright, FBI agent, whom the FBI refused to allow to testify and the Commission did not subpoena him. John M. Cole, FBI counterintelligence who had pertinent information with regard to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the 9-11 attacks. He notified the 9-11 Commission during its tenure but never received a response back from them. Colleen Rowley, FBI Division Counsel. The FBI Commission did not interview her and chose instead to rely on tran transcripts from the Joint Senate House Intelligence Inquiry. Mike German, FBI Counterintelligence. In, FB in, in February 2004, his name and contact information were provided to the Commission as a key witness, but they never called him to testify. 
Mark Burton, Senior Analyst at NSA. He provided dozens of pages of information and testimony to the 9-11 Commission, but was ignored and was never invited to testify. Beru Sashar, Language Specialist at the FBI. He was refused twice by the Commission to testify, but finally did testify. However, his testimony was omitted from the final report. This list is in no way complete. Rather, it is just a small sample of legitimate witnesses or corroborators of valuable 9-11 related information to provide that they tried to provide to the Commission, but they were instead turned away. Knowing full well that the best source of how an agency really works would entail talking to the people who actually work there, why is it that the Commission refused these key witnesses an opportunity to tell what they knew? How could the Commission be trusted to make the right decisions without obtaining all pertinent information? Worse yet, what happens when the Commission actively and knowingly ignores that information? One whistleblower that we made sure the Commission met with was FBI Translator Sibel Edmonds. It was only when we walked her into the Commission's offices that they agreed to hear what she had to say. Sibel is here. Once the report was released, Sibel read it with great hope. Disappointed in the Commission's failure to address her very real concerns, she wrote in an open letter, quote, Unfortunately, I find your report seriously flawed in its failure to address serious intelligence issues that I am aware of, which have been confirmed, and which, as a witness to the Commission, I have made you aware of. Thus, I must assume that other serious issues that I am not aware of were in the same manner omitted from your report. These omissions cast doubt on the validity of your report and therefore on its conclusions and recommendations, close quote. A thorough and definitive investigation by the Commission would have addressed all of her concerns and spoken to all of the whistleblowers. It would have subpoenaed for the information it required and examined the plethora of information that, that other citizens and groups responsibly provided. And finally, without compromising our national security, it would have reported all of its findings with its redactions blacked out and submitted to the American people. In essence, the Commission could have produced a final product where the resulting conclusions and recommendations could be trusted. Instead, at the end of the day, what we got were some statements that truly insulted the intelligence of the American people, violated our loved ones' memories, and might end up hurting us one day soon. One such statement was that 9-11 that was a failure of imagination. A failure of whose imagination? What exactly does that mean? When you have a CIA director with his hair on fire, a system blinking red, 52 FAA warnings, an August 6, 2001 PDB entitled, Bin Laden Determined to Strike in the United States, leads on several 9-11 hijackers, including Al-Hazmi, Amadar, and Marwan al-Shahi, warnings from many foreign governments, a Phoenix memo warning of Islamic extremists taking flying lessons, the arrest of would-be terrorist Zacharias Moussaoui, facts imparted to one agent, Agent Frasca at the RFU of the FBI, 9-11 was truly a failure, all right, but I would certainly not call it a, a failure of imagination. Once again, these warnings and threats were not received in a vacuum, nor were they so common in occurrence that they should have been ignored in the wholesale and brazen manner in which they were. To me, it seems rather clear that there were enough warnings making their way to the appropriate people that meant that the proverbial dots should have and could have all been connected. And thus, in light of all the incoming information in 2001, exactly whose failure was it to understand that our new enemy was terrorism, and exactly who failed us by not having the agencies do anything in a defensive posture to, pr to protect Americans from just this possibility? Another outrageous statement made at the time of the release of the 9-11 final report that got a fair amount of media coverage was the one, everyone's to blame, therefore no one's to blame. The problem with that assumption is that it creates a no-fault government. And a no-fault government does nothing to ensure that things will be different or better in the future. When you hold people accountable, it serves as a deterrent for those that would repeat that same behavior in the future. For the record, I would like to see that assumption restated to read, everyone's to blame, therefore everyone's to blame. In fact, the fact that there has been no accountability for the failures that led to the deaths of almost 3,000 people is truly unconscionable and irresponsible on the part of all of our nation's leaders. So what do we do now? The tools of democracy available to the citizens of America to address these issues are incredibly limited. 
we asked for an independent commission to investigate 9-11 because that was the only tool that we, as American citizens, had access to and hope that our leaders, the members of Congress, and the American public would ensure its validity and that its ensuing recommendations would make us all safer, all as safe as we could reasonably expect to be in the event of another attack. We spent 14 months collecting information and lobbying for the creation of the commission and another 20 plus months monitoring the commission's work, forwarding any and all research, making sure to send along our questions for the witnesses who were questioned, attending the hearings, making phone calls and lobbying for the extensions of time and money, sending thousands of emails, all in the hope that in the end, Americans could feel confident that we had indeed the definitive story of 9-11. Sadly, as Americans, we have all been let down. On the morning of 9-11, I lost my husband and best friend of almost 16 years. My two children, Matt and Sarah, lost their beloved father on that terrible day. And from, and from that horrible day of September 11, 2000 forward, it has been made clear that in not allowing for truth and justice to prevail, America may have forever lost her way. For those who might question the reasoning and importance for reexamining the Commission's report, the events that led up to and the day of September 11th, one only has to recall the enormous ramifications that the attacks of September 11th have had on our country. Our leaders have, almost overnight, reformed government agencies and instituted innumerable law laws in the interest of national security and are, and are living in a post-9-11 era. Some, like the controversial Patriot Act, were forced through Congress without the benefit of congressional debate to determine its necessity and effectively find the proper balance between national security and our civil liberties. More lethally, our foreign policy has shifted to one of preemption, and thus we are at war in both Afghanistan and Iraq, where so many of our good men and women serving in the armed forces have lost their lives or have come home forever maimed. It is important to look back because in order for our leaders to make wise decisions about the changes we are instituting, we must understand what it was exactly that went wrong, that allowed our nation to become so vulnerable to terrorism. And we should not, and we should not feel it improper to re-examine the investigations and decisions already made, especially in light of the fact that right after the 9-11 attacks, our leaders went full speed ahead with so many changes most without the benefit of much of the information that has only recently been made available. Again, with lives on both sides of the equation, we cannot afford to be wrong or caught off guard either over there or here at home like we were on the morning of 9-11. Thus, only an honest reevaluation of how the 9-11 attacks could have happened will allow us to reverse the adverse consequences of overreaching laws and the existing loopholes in our security systems in order to allow us to be safer in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie, for that very compelling and uh, well-researched testimony and for reminding us of why we are all here, outlining those very important yet unanswered questions. Uh, Laurie, do you have a copy of your document, your well-researched document for Congresswoman McKinney's staff? Okay. Okay, we'd like to have that. You're speaking on behalf of the other family members, are you not? We'd like to introduce our questioners at this time to see if they have questions of this panel. Uh, we're going to, our, our questioners, I'm going to introduce them briefly and then we will entertain one question from each questioner. We're, um, Mike Rupert, who is from the wilderness. Mike. Wayne Madsen is the independent investigative journalist, Wayne. And Ray McGovern, who is a former CIA agent, Ray. Uh, we're going to begin our questioning with Representative McKinney. Thank you. And I really, well, I have a ton of questions. <laughs> but um, I think it's more important that I just make a statement. And that is how compelling and thoroughly researched your testimony has been today. How absolutely moving it was to hear your husband's voice so that we have the opportunity to touch and feel as best we can a little bit of what you feel 
what you must feel. And those feelings then compel you to ask questions, to seek answers, and you deserve to have those answers. I just want to thank you so much, the three of you, Lori, Mindy, and Monica, for being here with us today and enlightening us and sharing with us a little bit of your pain and of your patriotism to want the best out of your government, our government, and for the future of our country. Thank you very much. We'll begin our questioning now, Mike Rupert. Can you nope. press the button Not to press turn the, the mic on? Thank you. Okay, this is uh, this is difficult for many of us, and somewhat cathartic even all this time after the attacks. And I think I speak for many people in this room to express my gratitude uh, to you because it's apparent that you have not stopped digging even after the release of the Kane Commission report and. Uh, your position seemed to have changed a great deal since then. One of my biggest questions would be, you mentioned them in passing, the war game exercises, which we now know were taking place. There were five simultaneous exercises, and I think we'll hear from another presenter today, six, which in effect paralyzed NORAD response on the day of September the 11th. Uh, and you'd also gone to read the footnotes, and I want to comment that uh, I saw uh, 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 Congressman Hamilton, who was the vice chair of the commission on C-SPAN, recently denigrating people who bothered to read the footnotes and point out the inconsistencies, but I thank you for doing that. There is one particular footnote that I will refer to very quickly in, uh, in uh, the Kane Commission report, which referred to uh, the war game exercise Vigil and Guardian, and I, I think it's footnote 161. It's in my book. Uh, as an over-the-pole Russian exercise uh, to practice for uh, Russian bombers when in fact uh, the NORAD website indicates that the Russian over-the-pole exercise in progress that day was Northern Vigilance, not Vigilant Guardian, which we now know thanks to USA Today uh, and many other uh, sources and on the record sources submitted to the commission was a hijack drill. And we also have statements from Richard Clark in his book that there was another exercise in progress that day called Vigilant Warrior. And I have ob obtained an on-the-record statement from a NORAD officer indicating that that was a live fly exercise. Have you looked into the, uh, the issue of the war game exercises and how important a question do, do you feel that is to answer? Because I also, and I'll shut up with this, you have gone past the point of you have deliberately stopped using the word mistakes that there were a bunch of mistakes that occurred on 9-11, that it was all somehow a bunch of sequential accidents, and you made a deliberate statement about the FBI. Do you, are you beginning to feel that there was some deliberate action uh, that might have affected NORAD's response that day? Um, <clears throat> we waited a long time before we came out with, you know, criticism of the report because it took a long time to read the report and the footnotes and wait for the monographs to come out. Um, we didn't want to jump to any conclusions, so we, um, we gave everybody the benefit of the doubt for a very, very long time, which is why our language has shifted now that we see, you know, more of what was and wasn't in there. As far as the war games go, <clears throat> you know, we, ha we read Richard Clark's um, book also, and I think it's page four that talks about a different exercise that's not in the commission report, and it's something that has disturbed us also because if you're talking about the definitive <clears throat> report of 9-11, everything that happened on the morning of 9-11 should be included, and it isn't. So it's, it's you know, it's upsetting. Thank you. Before we go to our next questioner, I'd like to ask if there are any speakers in the audience who have not had an opportunity to contact John Judge, would you please raise your hand? Okay. And John is at the end of the table. If you could go over there and see him. Our next questioner, uh, Wayne Matson. Uh, thank you. Uh, Laurie, I was 
particularly interested in what you said about the United Flight 93, the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, and the lack of any seismographic record of that impact. And I was wondering if you had had the chance or opportunity to speak to any of the people in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where the plane actually crashed, because many of them talk about the eight-mile debris field, which is not indicative of an impact by putting the plane into the ground. Also, they mention another aircraft seen in the area that day, that morning. And the other thing I'll add is, although we hear an awful lot right now from disgruntled people in many of the intelligence agencies, one we don't hear an awful lot from is the National Security Agency. And I had the chance to talk to someone who was on duty that morning at the National Security Operations Center, the NSOC, which is sort of the nerve center for all communications intercepts in the U.S. intelligence community. And this individual heard in the tactical communications area over the loudspeaker that morning two U.S. Air Force pilots over Pennsylvania stating, we are engaging the target. And so this is the first indication out of NSA that there were U.S. military aircraft in the area and that they obviously did what Mr. Rumsfeld, he kind of messed up and he said when they shot down the plane in Pennsylvania and then corrected himself. But I was wondering if you've heard any of this from the people in Shanksville or any other sources on the plane in Pennsylvania. You know, we did not speak to anybody in Shanksville. Our bottom line was that we were hoping that that was the job of the commission. And at the end of the day when they released their report, there wouldn't be so many questions outstanding either by us or other citizens that you would have been able to read the report and felt that you had all those areas covered. And, you know, obviously it wasn't. Thank you. Our last questioner, Ray McGovern, former CIA agent with VIPS, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. I would like to refer first to the remark made by Congresswoman McKinney referring to Colin Powell's very mysterious promise that we would have a white paper. He made that promise a week or so after 9-11 and then 10 days later he said, oops, I misspoke. You're not going to have a paper, a white paper on this. You're going to have to depend on the press to figure out what happened. That's precisely what he said. I was always mystified by that. I said to myself first, well, he must not have much information. Well, I think that Laurie Van Aken's testimony today, however brief it was, shows that there was a plethora of information. Indeed, the reason there's no white paper is because there was too much damning, too much incriminating information, too much. And I just would like to comment on the, well, the unusually smiling and greatly deferential attitude that the committee members and staff exhibit to you, the families, in public. And the way they have ignored your questions in private. And I'm just wondering how you feel, how you felt when you saw the final report come out, dismissing many of your questions, avoiding many of the others, and leaving, as you've already said, so many questions unanswered. What do you suppose lies behind that? Is it simply gross incompetence? Is it arrogance? Or is it something worse? You know, I don't know. And what I can tell you is that, unfortunately for us, we've learned to lower our expectations every time we go through another process. So when the final report came out, while we were hopeful, you know, it was just another disappointment. But we feel that we have to remain undeterred from those disappointments and just keep plugging along. It's 
not for us to determine motive or why. We need to make sure that the mission of making the nation safe is completed, and we will just keep plodding along until we feel that that has been accomplished. I admire you all for hanging in there. Thank you. Thank you all. We want to thank the panel, panelists, and invite our second panel to move to the table, please. Can we show them our appreciation yes. for being here this morning? Moving quickly to our second panelist, we could ask John Judge, Mel Goodman, and David McMichaels, McMichaels to join us at the panelist table, please, quickly. Is David McMichaels here? If so, would you please join us at the panelist table? Our second panel, uh, we could ask everyone to resume your seats quickly so we can begin our second panel. This discussion will be behind the 9-11 Commission, flaws in the process, a staff report, a citizen's critique. We're going to begin with John Judge. Uh, staff and 9-11 Citizens Watch. John? Thank you. Um, we're running late and I wanted to keep my comments short, uh, but I think that it's in the best interest of everyone to take a second look at what we've been given as a final report of the National Commission on Terrorist Acts upon the United States. It's being seen as an authoritative report, often by people that haven't taken the time to read it. Uh, it was hailed as a bipartisan consensus uh, in the making and a final word. And I think all day today you're going to see that uh, it, it rarely meets that standard. It was uh, followed by two monographs uh, and then a year later one more, although each of the nine investigative teams are working on a monograph uh, Representative Hamilton uh, said that we will get no further monographs uh, from those investigative teams. And it's interesting that the monographs that were released contained a page from Director Philip Zelikow of the Commission uh, basically uh, uh, exempting them from the conclusions of the monograph, saying that the, uh, the quote is, uh, while the commissioners have been briefed on the work, and have had the opportunity to, re to review earlier drafts of some of this work. They have not approved this text, and it does not necessarily reflect their views 
this seems to indicate that while there might have been a bipartisan consensus by the commissioners in this report, there didn't – does seem to – seems to reflect there might not have been a consensus between the investigative staff and the rest of the – the people on the commission. It was – it was a commission that was beset with problems from the beginning, not only the obstruction in its creation, but underfunding that wasn't really effectively solved in a limited time period for political purposes. And even though they did a great deal of work, 2,000 interviews, collected documents, the report is essentially self-referential. The reason I say that is that almost 100 pages at the end of the report in tiny print have footnotes to interviews and documents and evidence, not a page of which, classified or unclassified, can be seen by the public. The National Security Archives recently did a Freedom of Information Act request for every single document listed in the footnotes from all the agencies involved, and every single request was denied. And so the – and denied in some cases on – on grounds that don't fit the legality. So basically you have a report where you're being asked to trust the investigators that what they saw in the evidence led them to their conclusions, and you don't need to verify it independently. But I don't think that's the way it should work in a democracy. They took some public testimony, but that testimony was marked by being primarily focused on the recommendations of the Commission and its policy, not on the events of 9-11. And the majority of that testimony on – on the events was taken at the end of the long discussion about policy. In other words, they were making the policy recommendations before they found out what happened on 9-11. And the actual author of the report is still unstated, but I think in recent articles in the New Republic by Ernest May, we get an inkling, and also the release of the book Blind Spot, part of which was commissioned to be written by the 9-11 Commission by Timothy Naftali, that Naftali is at least the intellectual author of the report, and its primary conclusion that this was an intelligence failure. And that's the focus of his book. Zalikow, the director, Ernest May, who also worked on the Commission's staff at the top level, and Naftali, who was commissioned to do that work, all three are part of the University of Virginia Miller Center on Public Affairs, a rather interesting institution that bears some scrutiny, and they have a long history together of scholarship at Yale and Harvard that interlinks with studies of U.S. intelligence, and including contracted work with U.S. intelligence concerning covert operations. And I think that that's one of the main problems that exist when you create a national security state, is how do you investigate it without involving the people that are already part of that national security state. And this report reflects that in the choice that they made of the people that would be brought on to the staff. And I'm sure we'll be addressing some of that later, but they say it openly in Ernest May's article that that was actually their priority, to get people that had been part of earlier covert operations. And yet at the same time, the report fails, as we'll see in testimony later today, to address the historical framework of the covert operations that seem to have led into 9-11. The missing white paper was mentioned, and it did show up in England. In the British press, they said that a white paper about the suspects and the evidence was given to them in order to get them to participate in the war in Afghanistan. And the quote in the British press was, it's not enough to go to court, but it's enough to go to war. And so I'm not sure what the paper would show or what kind of evidence that is, but it isn't evidence that we ever got a chance to look at. This commission's report is not a rush to judgment, it's rather a rush to exoneration. And it fails to really hold people to accountability. In doing that, it doesn't make a witch hunt out of an investigation, but having standards of accountability, at least calling witnesses that might be accountable people in the events, would lead to a rigorous investigation and maybe getting at the truth, because people might be more forthcoming. In the beginning, the commission didn't even take testimony under oath. And Governor Keene, the director, told us that they thought people would be more forthcoming if they were not under oath. We found that a little counterintuitive. So I think that 
in addition to its own flawed assumptions and how it approached it, it also faced ongoing obstruction by the White House that refused to release documents, even refused to release the classified version of the joint Senate and House Intelligence Inquiry study that had been prepared by some of the people that sat on the 9-1-1 Commission and who had sat in on the classified testimony of that commission. And they did that consistently in terms of who would be testifying publicly and whether it would be under oath or not. There was very little transparency and very little accountability. They were exempt under the law from the Freedom of Information Act in their work, and they were exempt from the Family Advisory Committee Act so that there couldn't be any formal advisory committee by the family members that were here, and no family member was part of the board. And by approaching the whole matter as an intelligence failure in the report, it obscured the evidence that what was normally a standard operating procedure in the period prior to 9-11 fell apart, apparently, in the months around and on that day. And it led to them pursuing leads and suspects, basically accepting earlier reports without doing further follow-up, blaming certain suspects, even though the evidence is that we don't yet clearly know who the suspects were that got onto the plane, and that's because several people have come forward saying that their identity was stolen, basically, by these people. So if we track that identity back in time, it doesn't tell us whether it's the person using it, the second person using it, or the original person involved. And it's only that evidence, tracing those identities back in time, and primarily the testimony of three people that are still in protective custody that the Commission could not interview. I'm talking about Ramzi Yusuf, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Bin Al-Sheib, who are suspects, are masterminds in the plot, never been brought to court. No one can question them. The Commission was not even allowed to talk to their handlers or interrogators. All they could rely on were the printed statements taken from these people in custody. We don't know if the statements are accurate or real. We don't know if they were conditions of torture. We have no idea because there was no way to check it. And so we're left with a story that comes from people that we can't get to, and we're left with a story that perhaps is giving us the wrong direction in terms of how we're looking. But until we open up the report and until we can look at the actual evidence and compare it and begin to actually investigate further on many of the areas that the Commission ignored, then we have a report that doesn't eventually serve the mandate that this Commission was required to take care of, of looking at the truth of terrorist acts upon the United States. And it was acts. It was plural. And another terrorist act upon the United States the Commission completely ignored was the anthrax incidents that followed about a month later and that have never been adequately investigated or brought forward. That investigation seems to have stopped at a point where they got to the gate of Fort Detrick and then there hasn't been anything since. And this is going on years now in the situation. Okay. John Judge, a member of Citizens Watch, we should say an advocacy group that diligently monitored the government's actions and currently a staff assistant with Representative McKinney's office. Mel Goodman is a professor of international security at the National War College and a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. From 1966 to 1986, he was a senior CIA Soviet analyst. And in 1991, he was one of three former CIA officials to testify before the Senate against the nomination of Robert Gates as director of central intelligence on the ground that he had slanted intelligence to suit policy. Mel Goodman. Thank you very much. Two personal remarks first. One, I want to thank Congresswoman McKinney for what she is doing. This is an important examination of a 9-11 commission that was an historic opportunity that was missed in a 9-11 commission study that is terribly flawed. And I know that Congresswoman McKinney is perceived by many as to be contrarian. Well, I know how difficult it is to be a contrarian in the limited kinds of democracy we practice these days, and I hope one day her views will be considered conventional wisdom and not contrarian views. My other personal observation is I just left the government after 42 years of service, mainly with the CIA, but also the Department of Defense, the State Department, and the U.S. Army. 
that experience was important to me i believe in public service and i've always believed that institutions will prevail over the long run and truth will come out and i think the nine eleven commission has taught me that we need to be extremely rigorous and extremely tenacious in pursuing that truth because there's a corporate mentality in this country that's working against allowing the truth to surface even in tragedies such as the nine eleven tragedy this morning i'm going to talk about the flawed commission itself and this afternoon i'm going to be talking about the flaws of the commission reforms which for the most part are counterproductive and will ultimately do great harm to the intelligence community but there is one piece of connecting tissue that i want to emphasize uh... in my morning remarks and my afternoon remarks and it's very simply this the nine eleven tragedy this terrible tragedy was not due to oversight problems it wasn't due to budgetary problems it wasn't due to systemic uh... or structural organizational problems it wasn't due to organizational flaws this is what the nine eleven commission studied and this is what they would have you believe the nine eleven tragedy was due to personal failings institutions didn't make mistakes people made mistakes and the nine eleven commission needed to observe the importance of accountability and they didn't do this and finally and this is my real regret the nine eleven tragedy was about bureaucratic cowardice at places such as the pentagon and the department of defense and this needed to be examined as well and i hope eventually we can get into those areas now let me say something about the commission i want to talk about the commission itself about the flawed process of the commission and finally about the conflict of interest within the commission that is extremely important to understand the failure uh... of the commission remember there have only been three historic opportunities when we've had a chance to look at the intelligence community in this country one was after pearl harbor and that led to a series of investigations that not only provided very trenchant analysis of what went wrong but provided an outline for the national security act of nineteen forty seven which really was the most far uh... far reaching uh, important national security reform we've ever had in this country because when the national security act of forty seven did was to set up the national security community as we understand it today the second opportunity was after a period of important cia domestic abuses and that was the church committee and the pike committee the church committee and the pike committee came up with excellent reforms that unfortunately were observed in the breach and if we had followed the wisdom particularly of senator frank church the late frank church uh... we may have prevented uh, the terrible tragedies that have taken place in the last five years in terms not only of 9-11 but using false intelligence to send Americans into war where they did not belong uh, uh, in Iraq. The third opportunity unfortunately was the 9-11 tragedy which gave us this important opportunity to at least try to get the intelligence community which spends over forty billion dollars a year try to get this institution uh, correct and to understand it and to see what reforms uh, need to take place and of course with the 9-11 commission this wasn't done at all uh... the 9-11 commission had the broadest mandate of any commission in the history of the united states with the exception of the pearl harbor commission there's probably been no more important national security commission but in terms of broad mandate the 9-11 commission could have looked at any aspect of this tragedy and it's regrettable that they didn't do that let me briefly look at the commission uh... itself what this country needed was an independent nonpartisan commission the commission wasn't nonpartisan it was presented to us as bipartisan but when you appoint a group of people five democrats and five republicans that is certainly not nonpartisan and i would argue it isn't even bipartisan what it is is balanced partisanship and you look you can look at the commission's report time and time again to see where the democrats on the commission check the views of the republicans and the Republicans on the commission check the views of the Democrats. So forget this notion that this was somehow a bipartisan uh, commission. It wasn't. It was balanced partisanship, and it did a great deal of harm to the final product. Uh, also, if you look at the makeup of the commission, here you have an insufficiency in the kinds of people who were picked to be on the commission. And I'm not going to look at the commission members one by one. But the fact of the matter is, this is a group of people without any intelligence experience at all. This is not a group of people. Not one individual in this commission had ever received a president's daily briefing report, had never been involved as a consumer of intelligence, had very little understanding. And that was particularly true for one of the chairmen, the governor from 
New Jersey, who admitted he had no understanding of the intelligence community whatsoever. So there was insufficient stature, there was insufficient experience, there were insufficient knowledge of intelligence when this was totally relevant to what needed to be done. It would have been very easy to get a blue ribbon commission. You know, where were people such as Sam Nunn, William Perry, George Shultz, General Brent Scowcroft, Bill Bradley, David Boren, Gary Hart, even Warren Rudman, people who had served on the intelligence committees who would study the problem of intelligence and policy very closely and may have had a contribution to make on the importance of change within the intelligence community. Now let me look briefly at the process itself. The lack of stature may have contributed directly to the lack of rigor and the lack of tenacity within the commission. The previous speaker spoke eloquently about the subpoena power that was unused, virtually unused, maybe totally unused. This was a commission that deferred at every step of the way to executive privilege. They had a mandate where they did not have to defer to executive privilege. Take the point of view about the President's daily briefs. The entire commission was not allowed to examine the President's daily brief. Only four commissions got a look at some of the President's daily briefs. So no commission member came away with an idea of what did the CIA actually inform the White House about the problems of terrorism in the spring and summer of 2001. The commission also had the very good idea and correct idea that they should do their own debriefings of detainees. Now we didn't know then, but we certainly know now how the CIA and the military used torture to gain testimony from these captives. But George Tenet told the co-chairman of the 9-11 Commission that they could not have permission to debrief the detainees on their own, and the commissioners just faded away. They didn't pursue this matter. They didn't go to the mat with George Tenet on this one. And also the matter of allowing the President and the Vice President to be debriefed together. This is obviously no way to run a commission. Now in addition to the weakness in terms of rigor and tenacity, I think it's very important that the commission did not avail itself of the products that were out there, some completed, some nearing completion, some in important stages of the drafting process that would have been very useful to their own work. And the obvious document that they needed to have that they made no attempt to take full use of was the CIA Accountability Report. Now not a lot is known about the CIA Accountability Report on 9-11, but this is the only report out there that actually gets into naming names, into dealing with those people who perform miserably in the period prior to 9-11. Remember, accountability is what is really one of the key issues that's at stake here. Find out who was involved. Find out if these people were rewarded for their work instead of punished. And see what accountability issues can allow you to make systemic changes within the intelligence community. Now the irony of all of this is that the CIA Accountability Report was requested by a joint Senate House inquiry from 2002, which was signed by the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Porter Goss. Well, who is now sitting on the CIA Accountability Report that was completed exactly a year ago, actually in June 2004? None other than the Director of Central Intelligence, who is now Porter Goss. But in addition to not looking at the CIA Accountability Report, the Commission didn't take advantage of the excellent work being done by the Rob Silberman Commission on Weapons of Mass Destruction to show that there were no weapons of mass destruction, even though you had one of the co-chairmen, Governor Kaine, who believed the Bush administration rationale for why we had to go into Iraq because of the so-called links between Iraq and al-Qaeda and so-called large stocks of weapons of mass destruction. They didn't avail themselves of the CIA Accountability Report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Thank